call from Vietnam. It's about 12.45 here now, and uh, the sun's starting to beat down. It's about 100 degrees outside. So I thought this would be an opportune time to get in out of the heat and take refuge in one of the hooches that the lieutenants sleep in and proceed to describe the slides that I have in front of me. Okay, the first one shows a Chinook carrying a load over me. When I took the picture, I was down on Highway 1. The Chinook can carry a, an external load of about 7,000 pounds and an internal load of about the same weight. However, it can't carry both of them at the same time. The next slide is a scene traveling south on Highway 1. You can see the old railroad trestle there. Trains don't travel on it any longer. And you can see the Vietnamese farming. Well, right now they're using the primitive method of a two pieces of rawhide tied to a bucket and are trying to put water from one rice paddy into another one. The next slide shows Tom Patterson, who's the executive officer in B Battery, in an inopportune pose on his way to the shower. Right now a chopper is going overhead. I hope you can pick it up on the tape. From time to time the choppers come in and land and pick up forward observers or else pick up supplies to take out to the observers who are out on some outposts from 10 to 12 miles away from here. Pretty nice to hear them come in and out from time to time. Getting back to the slide, uh, old Patterson's on the way to the shower during the daytime and as an exec and quite a few of the officers around here just get a shower when they can. I'm fortunate and able to take one at night and kind of have a routine broken down during the daytime. Uh, the next slide, there goes a chopper right over the hooch, is taken from uh, the village just below B Battery and it shows some of the local Vietnamese taking it easy underneath the trees. And that road is Highway 1 which goes right by the village. In fact, this isn't much of a Highway 1. There goes another chopper. Okay, the next slide is a scene off the road on Highway 1 which shows uh, an arid field in the background, but in the foreground is a rice pie that's productively growing rice. It is also a good haven for the ducks that you can see floating around. The next slide. This is a view of a Huey chopper just about to set down over at Task Force Oregon headquarters. You can see that that's a, a helipad there and there are a couple other choppers on the pad. It's really amazing how they can utilize all these choppers in Vietnam. And there are quite a few of them that fly overhead from various times of the day and night. Uh, utilize is a word that I've picked up since I've been in the Army. They use that instead of use. Next slide. This is the view that I get when I stand out behind my hooch. And at the top of the mountain is an outpost. And from this outpost can be seen the whole valley. We can watch the Vietnamese farm by day and get fired upon at night. Most of the firing that goes out there, the exchange between the VC and armed helicopters or planes, bombing, and so forth, takes place about 10,000 meters outside our perimeter. So we have a pretty secure feeling up here. Just below the hill, you can see the gun pits at Charlie Battery. And at night when they fire, it raises us right out of our sleep. I'm getting now so I can sleep through them pretty well, but even though they do make quite a bit of noise, we like to hear them as long as they're outgoing and not incoming rounds. I'm sure we'll be able to live with them. The next slide is a posterior view of me paying the Vietnamese whom we hire at 80 piastres a day. 80 piastres is somewhat less than a dollar a day, and these folks work about eight hours a day filling sandbags and performing other tasks that we have for them around the compound. Some of them work pretty well, but others have uh, become pretty well unionized in an unofficial way. Don't work very hard at all. 
The next picture are the boys that are over there supervising these Vietnamese. As you can see from the picture, they like a little bit of slack too. That's my Jeep that they're all crowded around. Next slide. It's probably the way General Westmoreland looked when he was just a first lieutenant. That's my driver who has uh, just been transferred today to another unit. As you can see, he enjoys the picture too. The next three pictures I can't make out very well. Maybe they'll come out on the slide projector. And they should show Captain Simpson, who's a battery commander of Sea Battery, standing at the door like he just broke into the Long Branch Saloon. He's got a bayonet in his hand and it's quite a combat scene. There should also be a picture of myself in there with uh, my battery commander who is Captain Hannon. He and I are just sort of standing there bemused by the scene of the previous Captain Simpson walking through. And the next slide is something I can't make out at all. So I hope you're pleasantly surprised with its outcome because I don't even know what it is. Okay, the next slide, which is 14, shows some Vietnamese in the field with their water buffalo pulling the plow. Again, this is a very primitive means of agriculture. And as you can see from the picture, they wear white hats to keep the sun off, yet they still wear dark pajamas, which seems to me would absorb the heat. I don't think I'll ever be able to figure these people out. The next slide is also a picture of the Vietnamese farming. You can see the wet rice paddy. It looks like it's productively producing rice. And then again, they have the primitive people out there farming. Next slide, we stopped in the village going up to B Battery, and as, about as soon as I pulled out my camera, these three little kids appeared at the door, and all of them were smoking cigarettes and were scantily clad. Quite a common scene around here. Next slide shows a picture from B Battery looking out on the road, which is Highway 1 heading south. You can see the bridge there, which the Vietnamese guard by day. There's a bypass for when the monsoons come or for when the VC blow up the bridge. At this date, they haven't blown it up lately, and I hope that they don't do it while I'm around. Next slide is another view of the same general location. This next slide shows the Vietnamese village just south of B Battery, and again, these kids are eager to pose for a GI picture. Some are pretty cute, others they don't really show too much friendship toward the Americans. Last slide is a close-up of a Huey, which was taken up at the 196 Brigade headquarters, which is south of us on Highway 1. And that's the way it looks in my little corner of the world. As time goes on, I'll attempt to take some more pictures of what our compound looks like and some of the people who are around here, and some of these people are pretty amusing. So I'll sign off for now, and it's the 14th of July, we only have about 10 more months to go. So, keep those cards and letters coming. Good morning, Vietnam. Today's another one of those days, except it's the 20th of July, and this marks my last day in service battery. Uh, later on this morning, I'm going to assume the job of executive officer of Charlie Battery, and uh, as I told you before, Charlie Barry is uh, the fine barry right behind us. And when I get up there, I'm going to be the man who makes the big guns go boom, boom, boom. And all hell will break loose when I say it. I was hoping that maybe we could get a sound of Charlie Barry firing here in the background as I talk. I got some more slides back from Honolulu, and I'll start the description of them right now. The first slide was taken... Uh, well, we're going up to A Battery, as many of these were, and they were taken while I was standing in a Jeep or sitting in a Jeep, and this, uh, this one, you can see I was pretty much off balance, and uh, to the right, you can see the ROK, which is Republic of Korea, otherwise known as ROC, ROC Marine Personnel Carrier, but to the left, you can see the arid land as it leads up to the mountains. 
and uh, it is a pretty good ways from Highway 1 to the beginning of the mountains. Next slide. This one shows a little better view of the personnel carrier. They have a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on the back of it. And again, you see the arid land to the left. Uh, the railroad track is running right along there. This is a uh, high tension wire. I don't know how much high tension there is in the wire, but I can tell you that the railroads haven't run here in many moons. The VC took care of that, I guess, a few years ago. Next slide. This slide was taken again from the road, and it shows in the foreground a, a person who was on the highway, but he got off the highway because of the great amount of dust that we were rolling up as we went along. And uh, you can see that the rice paddy is underwater, and in the background there's another v Vietnamese who's out tending his fields. It's amazing how these people can sit out there and work the fields about 10 or 15 hours a day. They're so small and skinny, it looks like they should be running gift shops or something. Next slide. This is a classic. Uh, this woman walked right beside my Jeep, and I stopped and took her picture. Uh, got quite a be beetle nut smile there. Beetle nuts are uh, something like LSD over here, and some of these people walk around like pretty high. I think they have to be just to live over here. But beetle nuts do a job on their teeth, and uh, you might be able to pick it out. Their teeth are pretty black. It's an amazing thing to watch these people carry heavy loads over their backs on a yoke, and they just seem to glide right along and not step as we normally are used to stepping. And you see about four or five of them walking down the road with these buckets over their back, and they're just gliding along, just as though they're in their right minds. Next slide. This uh, shows a picture of the Vietnamese fleet. The sails are down, the fleet's in. Just one lone little old fishing boat in a bay as we go north on Highway 1. They do a considerable amount of fishing right off the bay as we are real close to the sea. And that's one of the principal uh, portions of the diet fish. So I don't know how successful they are or how much fish is over here, but they do a lot of fishing over here anyway. Next slide. This one shows the Vietnamese out tending his herd in a rice paddy that has been laid farrow for a year. It looks like they rotate the fields over here, and uh, this must be the Vietnamese equivalent to hay. But as you can see, the cows over here are almost as skinny as the people. Everyone seems to be emaciated, and I don't think they really get enough to... Next slide. Well, looky here. This is me up on top of the Rat Patrol Jeep. Uh, what makes it a Rat Patrol Jeep, of course, is the fact that we got the M60 machine gun mounted on a machine gun mount. And we use this when we go out on the highway leading the convoys. And uh, this is taken up an A battery. You can see the gun pit off to the left. And there are a lot of five tons and some ammunition out in the background. That's probably the way old Westy looked when he was a first lieutenant, just jogging around. Great life. Can't beat it. Next slide. Here's another Rat Patrol fan. This is uh, Dick Birch. He's from Oklahoma, and I met him at Fort Bragg, and he's uh, the fire direction officer for our battery. He's a good man, has a good sense of humor, and he also enjoys having his picture taken a la Rat Patrol. Next slide. The people over here seem to be Americanized and that they feel it pays to advertise. Uh, this this was taken going north on Highway 1. And here the tires, the patches, to inflate, very good. Other ones say instead of very good, number one, or this is the best. And uh, a friend of mine had, his, had a flat tire right close by there one day. And he came in and they did, in fact, patch the tire for him. And they were going to charge him two and a half. He offered them a dollar and a half, and they eventually decided to uh, settle for a dollar seventy-five. The prices over here are inflated. In fact, it's inflated quite a bit. And uh, people, when they go to town, generally try to quabble over the prices with the Vietnamese. But they give you the same song and dance that they give you in the States. Overhead taxes, insurance, 
and they have to transport it from Saigon or Da Nang. But if uh, you offer them 30 to 50 percent less than what the price is, they tell you, you can generally reach a happy medium. Uh, you have to get your jellies over here somehow. And on my infrequent trips to town, uh, it's really amazing to watch these people in, op in operation. They want to sell you the whole shop. To date, I've bought just a pair of Ho Chi Minh sandals, which are made out of tires and inner tubes. They're pretty good against the ground. I wore those before I got my sneaks in the mail. Uh, next slide. This is a picture of Captain Hen suiting up for a road trip. As you can see, he's putting on a flag vest there, uh, which we are all required to wear when we go out on the road. They are pretty warm, pretty cumbersome, but you feel pretty safe when you have one on. It buttons up your front and back, and the only thing that is left exposed uh, are your arms. You can see that he's got a cigarette in his mouth, and I was sitting in the back of the Jeep at the time and caught him unaware. He's a pretty good combat man, and uh, naturally he's a career soldier. When you get to get tracks on your hat, you generally hear to stay. Next slide. This is taken right outside my hooch on the 4th of July. If you look closely in the center, you'll see a white cloud distinguished from the clouds of the sky. This is what is left after a white phosphorus attack. A battery fired six rounds in here, and uh, there was some, a suspected VC location. And if it didn't get any VC, I'm sure it gave them something to think about. Uh, that shot was about 7,500 or 8,000 meters away from our area. And that's a pretty good distance away. But every time there's an air, air strike over there or an artillery strike, everybody looks over and admires the beauty of our shooting. Next slide. This picture was taken right outside my hooch, and uh, it's looking up toward the uh, quarters where the troops sleep. You can see that the big bunker, which is prominent in the picture, is a, it's a 10 by 10 room made out of 2x12s and 8x8s plus 3 feet of sandbags around it. It's designed to withstand a direct hit of an 81 millimeter mortar, which is the largest weapon the VC possess, generally. And to the left, the gray building is our latrine. As you can see, it's an air job, and you can sit in there and watch the rest of the world go by. This is one of the few places that you can leave the party and you don't miss a trick. At night, you can sit in there and see the bright lights of the air, air base and also listen to the sounds of the night. Just like camp. Next slide. Uh, this is another picture of the same scene that we saw a little while ago. Uh, again, you look for the smoke in the middle and right down near the ground is one that has just been fired. We're overlooking the Colonel's Hooch, which is right in the middle, the tin roof job in the middle. And also you can see some of the other buildings in the background, which are uh, the 18th Artillery Battalions. It's a pretty cozy little hill up here. We have the headquarters and service batteries of two battalions plus a firing battery of ours. And over on the right, you can see uh, the valley where all the VC farm by day. At night, Marine patrols generally go out there to make sure that these VC aren't also fighting us by night from that area. Next slide. What do you know, another Rat Patrol fan. Uh, this is a kid who is the supply clerk, and he also volunteers for machine gun duty on the convoys. It's really amazing how many people want to get in and be the machine gunner on the convoy. Uh, right behind him, you can see the, our day room. That's where the people go to relax. We have a TV set in there, plus a stereo, and we call it Cherry Hill a Go-Go. Of course, you know there aren't any go-go gals around here, but the only go-go thing in there is the spirit of the Chai Sox. It's a pretty good morale booster. N next slide. Here's another picture of a uh, chopper. This one was taken when we were traveling on the Highway 1. And as you see, that uh, the chopper's carrying a load. I think it's a concrete or stone. And whatever you can't transport over the road, they generally put them in a chopper of some description and haul it away that way. The place really goes wild over here with the helicopter traffic. I don't see how they can really control it effectively, and it's amazing they don't have more accents than what they really do have. Next slide. 
again, this is a chopper, and it's quite high in the sky. I must have been out of my mind taking so many slides of these choppers. But they kind of intrigue me. So maybe I'll take some more. Next slide. This is Sergeant Long on the, on the right and Sergeant Dove on the left. A couple of real fine NCOs in service battery. We were out one day clearing our weapons and trying to make sure that they shot fired the M60s and Sergeant Dove has a bandolier of M60 ammunition over his shoulder. Sergeant Long is making a neat comment. You can see that the antennas are down in the vehicles and when we're out for real the antennas are up and not too many people are smiling. Everybody's kind of watchful. Although everyone's getting more confident now and generally getting combat oriented if you can really call this combat over here. Next slide. Well, here I am again. This time the old machine gun looks like it's down for business, but when the antenna is down, you know that there's no business to be done that day. So this is just another one of those poses, and I happen to have my camera there. Next slide. Another chopper. This was taken down in the 196 Light Infantry Brigade area. The 196 Brigade is part of Task Force Oregon, and they have quite a bit of traffic of choppers down there. You can see all the uh, hooches there with the tin roofs on them. Uh, the Marines made or left quite a few of these here, and the 196 has built quite a few others. It consists of 2x4s, screen, and tin roof on top. It's pretty good. It keeps the people off the floor or off the ground, and uh, it's pretty cool. You get the maximum breeze. And uh, most of the artillery units over here are up on hills, which is against the classic uh, doctrine taught by the United States Army and also against the classic things they have done in past wars. But generally, the infantry takes the high ground. The artillery fires from the low ground. But over here, the artillery is on the high ground. You get an added benefit of having a pretty good breeze on the high ground. Uh, next slide. This is Naylor, who was my clerk back in the States, but due to his versatility, over here he's a truck driver. He seems to enjoy it pretty well, and if you look closely, you can see his Hindu beads. He claims that his girl gave these to him, and uh, he's a different type soldier, all right. He's got a mustache, which he kept much to the colonel's chagrin. In fact, the colonel protested, but he thought that was one of his civil rights, so he kept the mustache. He's a ex-beatnik from New York City, a dropout from NYU, and a real interesting kid. And this is about it for the slides for this time. I hope you enjoy the presentation, and I will continue to keep taking what the situation is. Uh, I think this is a pretty good idea. It kind of gives you an idea of what I see every day, and it beats writing about it, and it sort of gives you a view of what's happening over here. Today is uh, another one of those days, as I said before. The sun is out. It's getting up probably about 95 right now. And here it is only 9.30 in the morning. i got to pack up my duds and get heading up to Charlie Battery. And uh, we'll try to give you some big gun sounds from up there and also take some pictures of my new environment and all my new friends. This is really nice. Over here you can get a chance to have a job uh, every couple months, provided you can hang in there and do it. I don't know who's going to take over my job, but uh, Lord be with him. I'll give you a little rundown of what my hooch looks like right here. I'm sitting in a small tent. The captain and I are living in it, and uh, we have a radio which is generally designed to get MET messages, so we don't have a MET message capability. So what we do is have this radio in here to listen to the Armed Forces Radio Network. Got a great big closet made out of a shipping crate, a couple bookcases made out of smaller shipping crates. Uh, I got a cot here with an air mattress on it and a native blanket, which is actually a poncho liner. Looks like a camouflage cloth. And also have a mosquito net to keep all the bugs out. Have foot lockers on the floor and a wooden floor, which is really pretty high class over here. A lot of our fellow officers don't even have that. Uh, look, you see my briefcase here that has all my personal gear in it and my tape recorder, which I bought the other day. A GE has come out with one of these little jobs, and 
I don't know if I'm really dedicated to them or not, but it seemed like a pretty good price, and also it seemed like a real nice tape recorder. I'm playing this at one and seven eighths. It also has a three and three quarter speed capability, but they say that one and seven eighths is supposed to be the main one for uh, transmission. I also am looking at a bottle of gin I have here, and we've been having gin and seven up or gin and grapefruit juice, depending upon what we have and the time of the week. That's an extra special treat. There's a mermite can over here we keep filled with beer and soft drink. So despite all the hardships, we do have some of the refinements of life. And uh, nice and Mac to make sure that we get all that stuff. So that's about it. I hope you enjoy these tapes as much as I enjoy presenting them. And uh, I'll, as I say, I'll continue to keep you informed of what's going on over here. So adios until I see you again. This is the old ranger saying, keep those cards and letters coming. And I uh, sure did appreciate having those pictures sent. The one of Fulton J. Sheen is going right next to me, a St. Christopher medal on my Jeep. Can't be too safe over here. Hi again from uh, Vietnam. Uh, I've just finished dinner. I've got a cigar in hand and I'm sitting down. And I think I'll start into my slides. Of course, this is the land of the big beetle nuts in the land of Buddha. And I've been thinking lately that the way they have shrines around here to Buddha, he must be the combination of Santa Claus and Mr. Clean in Vietnam. I haven't been able to take any pictures of them uh, lately, but I'll try to include that in the next batch. Well, uh, now let's get into the slides. Uh, these slides are uh, some of the ones that I took at various times around here. There's no special topic. They're sort of a conglomeration of everything that I've seen in various times in the last uh, month or so. So the first one shows the picture of a battery right after the helicopter crashed into it. The bunker at the right hand side was the exec post and the chopper hit the exec post and bounced into a gun pit. Of course there are quite a few rounds of ammunition in the gun pit and they went off and caused quite an explosion which caused secondary explosions at the adjacent gun pits and uh, really caused quite a bit of damage. Next slide. Next slide shows some more of the damage. And uh, it's really remarkable looking at these that nobody was, in a battery was killed. A uh, few of them were injured. In fact, a couple of them were uh, in the same ward that I was back when I had my little touch with a fever of unknown origin. Next slide. Uh, the next slide is another picture of a battery. And uh, right to the left of uh, a white spot, you can see uh, how it's are in place. Of course, the artillery keeps firing no matter what happens. And about 20 minutes after the uh, explosion, the battery was back in operation and was firing at three guns. Next slide. This will give you a breather. I don't know what happened uh, to this slide, but maybe it's just one of those quirks of the mechanical age. Next slide. Uh, this next slide uh, was taken from down near our headquarters area on the hill and you see a dark cloud in the center of the picture. Well, that is a result or the smoke from a preparation fire which was fired by our battalion on a hill. And this preparation was preceding an assault by a air mobile type operation. And uh, there was continuous fire on a hill for about 20 minutes to kill anybody who was up there or at least to shake him up a little bit before the uh, infantry assaulted the hill. The next slide. This uh, shows some choppers there along the crest of the hill. And uh, these uh, helicopters were flying around for about 20 minutes before the preparation ended. They were just waiting to go in and uh, assault the hill. In the foreground is a shower, which I traipse to and, st and stumble over rocks and so forth. And uh, pretty nice shower, but in the cool, cool, cool of the evening. Right now I'm stumbling over rocks to another shower, which is also pretty good in the cool, cool, cool of the evening. Uh, next slide. This is another configuration of that helicopter entourage that was flying around the sky. 
uh, these uh, helicopters were circling our area, and uh, at times they were really a beautiful sight, the way they spread out and swooped and flew around up there. Uh, next slide uh, shows three Vietnamese who, as the Army calls them, are indigenous personnel, and one bebopper from New York City who was in service battery. Uh, the three Vietnamese wouldn't pose in the picture alone because uh, they're pretty superstitious about numbers and so forth. As you can see, they look like they're pretty much westernized and have the kind of casual look about them. The Vietnamese boy on the left has those pegged pants, and his uh, pants are high above his ankles. It looks like he should invite his pants down to his ankles and have a little party when they get together down there. Next slide. This is another picture of the helicopters as they flew just about over my position. And as you see, they're two abreast. And the one that's tailing, and there's another one I think that's out of the picture that's uh, above it, are gunships. And these gunships are just loaded with ammunition, uh, 40 caliber or better uh, rockets and 50 caliber machine guns. Well, on Hood River operation, we uh, saw some of these gunships work out. And if they spot something and start opening fire, it's uh, really trouble for anybody who's being hit by these things. And they're pretty good ships and seem to do a pretty good job when they're protecting convoys and other aircraft in the area. Uh, next slide. This is a slide taken at the first USO show that I saw over here, and it was uh, the Mrs. Miller show. These people on the stage are some up-and-coming musicians, and with all these shows over here, they may have one name star, but they have a second-rate group that accompanies them. These people may come from Sheboygan or South Dakota someplace or Watertown or uh, something like that, and then they play for Mrs. Miller, and then they go back to the States and appear on the Ed Sullivan Show or uh, Johnny Carson and say, boy, how the boys in Vietnam really appreciated them. I think some of these people try to get a name by coming over here and playing for the USO shows. Next slide. These uh, two kids that are on the stage call themselves the good guys. Not because they wore hats, but I guess Mrs. Miller took a liking to them and brought them along for the show. Uh, a lot of the GIs in the audience were making cracks to the effect of, uh, you know, they look pretty healthy, why aren't they drafted? Which uh, I think was a pretty good point. Uh, the next slide shows the good guys with Mrs. Miller in the middle. When she came out, she was a real riot, and everybody got a big kick out of her. Of course, she sings uh, satirically about the modern rock and roll songs, and everybody got a big kick out of her high-pitched voice when it should have been low-toned and so forth. I'm not really up on music, but I knew that she was offbeat, but she was real funny. Her act got old real quick, but everybody thought it was a good change of pace. In fact, the beat going out on an ammunition run, so it wasn't really a lost afternoon. Uh, this next slide is, again, this is Miller and the Good Guys. I didn't really think she was that great, so I wonder why I took so many pictures of her. Uh, this amphitheater is the one that Bob Hope appeared at last Christmas and the Christmas before that. And uh, it's one of the uh, semi-permanent installations over here in uh, the Chulai Defense Sector, which is across Highway 1 from where we are uh, at home base. In fact, uh, this area is pretty secured. And uh, right in front of this complex is a big PX where everybody goes when they have time. Uh, the seats are constructed of planks and uh, old ammo canisters. But the stage itself looks like uh, it was designed as a stage and that you good folks are paying for. Thank you. This next one is another picture of Mrs. Miller and the good guys. Uh, you could give one of these away if anybody's interested in having one because four of Mrs. Miller, I think, are too many. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the stone quarry, which is just below the hill we are uh, occupying. Charlie Barry's position is at the upper left-hand portion of uh, the hill in the background. And you can see uh, at the base of the hill, are the Vietnamese uh, work out here in this rock pile uh, about eight or nine hours a day for their 80 piasters. 
And uh, when they get a pretty good sized pile of rocks, well, a Navy truck or maybe a Vietnamese truck will come up and pick them up and they incorporate their stone with the stone that machines are crushing, which are out of the picture. And they're taken down to the Marines, uh, the, an engineer unit of the Marines, who are helping to reconstruct Highway 1. Uh, they're making a pretty good base on Highway 1 so it won't get washed out when the monsoons come here in another month or so. Uh, next slide. This next slide is a picture of Captain Hannon showing the Sergeant Major how to work the camera. He was just getting ready to take a picture of the Big Three of Service Battery. The Big Three, of course, being the First Sergeant, the Battery Commander, and myself. The uh, construction at the right is one of these uh, prefabricated houses which are sent over here, and people use them for their base camps. Uh, these are pretty nice little houses that keeps everybody off the ground and they're screened in and for a roof they just throw a tent over the top and roll the sides up so that people can get uh, maximum ventilation from the sides. Uh, next slide. This next slide shows the big three of service battery. Uh, on the left is uh, First Sergeant Big Earl Davis. The center is Captain Hannon. And on the right is Young West Moreland. Uh, in the background, you can see the Cherry Hill a Go-Go sign and service batteries colors in the bulletin board. You see the red painted barrel on the left and the yellow sign uh, rim. So there's quite a bit of the to-do of the stateside army with keeping anything that can be painted, painted, and everything's in a high state of police and so forth. In fact, that's one of the big things over here that surprised many of us. Uh, that is that many of the orderly things of the army are still go on over here. There's quite a bit of hard work involved and uh, much sandbagging and so forth. Quite a few of the people, I think, thought they were just going to get over here and say, pass a grape shot, fix bayonets, and throw sea ration cans in the street. And it's really not like that at all. In fact, there's everybody seems to have, uh, or seems to get good chow and hot chow and haven't been fixing bayonets here lately. Next slide. Uh, this is a picture of Captain Simpson on the right talking to two of the Red Cross volunteer girls who came up and visited our battery area. Uh, they really were big morale booster when they got up here and brightened up the Monday, which was otherwise the only uh, exciting thing on Monday was taking the malaria pill, which was taken weekly. The girls' name were Cookie and Sheila. Sounded more like a strip tease combo than a couple of donut dollies, but everyone enjoyed their company and their sort of perked up the people when they came up here. It was supposed to be a weekly event, but since we went out on Operation Hood River and are planning to go out on another one, I don't think we'll see these people very often. In fact, I wanted to see them after hours, but wasn't able to get any kind of uh, consideration. Next slide. Uh, this next slide is a picture of one of the girls who was dancing in the uh, Frankie Fontaine show. And she later came out with a real bright colored outfit and about five Marines got up there and helped her dance and it was pretty enjoyable. Uh, after the girls got through dancing, uh, no one really missed Frankie Fontaine or Crazy Guggenheim or Fatso Fogarty or any of the other characters that he portrays. But they say that old Frankie Fontaine was waylaid in Saigon or Da Nang, which uh, led people to speculate why he was here in the first place. Uh, this next slide was supposed to be of a jet which was cra crossing the path in the vehicle I was riding in. And I stood up there and tried to get a picture of it, but it looks like I missed. But ain't it a real nice looking road? In fact, it's one of the few McAdam roads around here. And this is taken, of course, in the uh, Chu Lai defense sector where all the roads are hard and wide and a uh, pretty well developed s network of roads much in contrast to Highway 1 and the road off Highway 1, which we traveled when we went on this operation, Hood River. In fact, uh, that road was really treacherous, and quite a few of the bridges were blown out. We had to use bypasses and everything. It was pretty exciting and a little bit scary. But we uh, came back from it all right, and I had taken about almost a roll of film, which I'll have developed, and I'll describe those pictures at a later date. For the last day or so, it's been raining around here lightly, but all the dust has turned to mud in some of the vehicles, I say vehicles, trucks and jeeps and stuff, are having a little rough go of it. In fact, they're slipping and sliding around. 
And if this is any indication of how it's going to be when it rains over here, it's going to be bad news. But then again, when it rains over here, we won't be going out on the road on any of these operations, so it may not be all that bad either. Uh, when I get a chance, I'll bring this uh, tape recorder out on the exec post and give you an idea how it uh, sounds up here when the guns are shooting. My job is somewhat like the quarterback of a football team, and when I say fire, the guns really uh, fire, and the boom can be heard for miles around, unless, of course, there's a hang fire or a misfire, which uh, causes a few minutes of panic. Uh, I've got the speed on this thing at three and three quarters. I started out at one and seven eighths, but I uh, couldn't talk long enough to fill up the tape. Never had that problem before, and I never really had a captured audience who I could indoctrinate before. But I don't really know what else to say but tell you about, you know, confine my comments to the slides because I'm not really that up on the political, sociological, and economic implications of this war over here. Although when you look at the slides, you can kind of get a good idea of what it's all about, or at least what some of the problems are over here. In fact, uh, this next operation, we're supposed to go out and uh, be around some mountain yards where some of the hillbillies of Vietnam, and uh, they speak an entirely different dialect from the locals around the Chu Lai area. And just a difference in dialects and language around here would be enough to probably neutralize a lot of the efforts that the Americans are making in trying to bring this thing to a close. But working with these Vietnamese, I guess, is quite a frustration. As uh, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of the Vietnamese that were out on this operation with us, and you may get a kick out of it. They look like little elves out there, but I'll get into that later. Now, if you get a chance to uh, record some music like the Supremes or Herb Alpert or some of these other stateside groups, it would be appreciated, and you can play it and send it back on the tapes when you come over. And about the things that you mentioned the tape, I'll uh, write about in the letter so that you can play these tapes to all the friends and neighbors and relatives. I didn't realize that you had such a following of my tapes and travel logs here, but it's pretty good, and I'll have to improve my diction and get my repertoire down a little better to make it a little more enjoyable. And maybe even get some background music up here to play. But uh, I don't see any Vietnamese string quartets around the area. So you just have to do it with the rat-tat-tatting of the air hammers in the background. And once in a while, a helicopter or an airplane going over. And maybe once in a while, a gun going off. So I see that the tape is getting down here. So I'll get ready to wind it up and send it on home. And uh, appreciate your cards and letters. And uh, all the guys say, hey. <laughs>